Gentlemen, it's time once again to discuss things. Greetings and no, 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 no. I'm doing the intro. You always come in on the intro. Now, <laughs> hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Geeky Gentlemen. Joining me today is my good friend, Lon Jeftik, 1992, who has been gone for two weeks now, and that's yes. been morning. I've been, I've been fighting ninjas. I've well, been kidnapped. Whatever. Yeah, that, yeah, I have, but you know, it's annoying. They leave blood everywhere. Mm. Uh, Bill, unfortunately, can't join us this week because of work schedules and everything not working out. Um, We fully planned to have this be the reunion of the three, but unfortunately, uh, you know, schedules schedules don't always work out, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. this week's topic is um, a debate, an idea-based topic, and less to do with, you know, the, like, a particular thing and more, much more broad, Um, like last week we did a very particular thing and this week we're going a lot bigger so Milan came up with the topic this time around Milan what is our topic well is um, the more darker tone of comic books nowadays turning off younger new readers all right so we're talking modern comics being what they are if that if the violence or if the the darker content overtones yeah. are are either stopping young people from reading them or just making young people not want to read them. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Why don't right. you say something that I wanted to say but better? Thank you. Mm. All right. Well, you want to start... Because I'm your superior in every way. Yes, yes, except, you know, physically, of course. But anyway, um, that's not... Oh, physically, idea. too. I can bench press an elephant. I'll be a, a, a toy elephant, but an elephant nonetheless. Okay, that's kudos there, my friend. But anyway, uh, should who should start uh, with the points? You or me? Ah, uh, well, it's your topic. Why don't Why don't we uh, let you take the lead on this one, buddy? All right then. Well, see, uh, this has to do with a video that I saw not too, uh, not too long ago uh, about um, it was a blow himself up video, and he said that kids don't buy comic books anymore. And that is not exactly true. You see, I have this comic book shop in, close to my house, and I know that kids don't read too many comics nowadays, but whenever I see a kid picking up a comic in a comic book store, or I give a couple of my older comics to some, you know, my nephews or, or something like that, it, it, and they enjoy it, and you see that little light in their eyes, and it reminds you of when you were a little kid, when you first got your first comic book and you read it, and you felt that elated uh, amazement for the first time, and it made it makes me feel good, and it, it makes me sad that kids nowadays don't have that type of joy, the type of you know amazement that we used to have with our comics. So, and it's I think comic books are are targeted to more of to the more of um to a more mature like early college age, early twenties, mid twenties. Um, late teen step of uh, a more of a sensible diagram uh, demographic demographic yes yes it's it, it's and it's kind of and i love modern comics and not to say that there's nothing out there for kids like not no no all ages books well all, action comics for one the superman title anyone can pick that up or well what else uh, is there? Juan, I, I hate to interrupt, but you're getting kind of far away from two things I wanted to bring up with something you were just saying. Certainly. And I want to bring these up while they're relevant. Go ahead. Um, the first point is a question, which I'm going to ask you to wait to answer until I'm done asking this, th- making the second point. Okay. Um, how old were you when you first started reading comics? And then the second point I wanted to make is there still exists that stereotype that comics are for children – when, as you were just saying, that they're, they're clearly marketed for people your and I age, in, in our generation, in our age group, mm. they're clearly set out to appeal to this demographic. Mm. But the stereotype still exists, and I'm not, you know, going off of a general tone that I get from people. I've actually had conversations with people in our age group that think comics are still for kids. Um, my One of my good friend's wives... She sat there one night and told me that 
superhero movies only do well because parents are taking their kids to them. And it's amazing the level of ignorance in that sentence. And I don't mean that in a, in a mean way. I mean ignorance strictly by the dictionary definition. Of course, of, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, just the level of ignorance in that sentence really did shock me because they're, it's just taking a stereotype and applying it without any kind of thought or, or looking into the situation at all. And that really, really surprised me about it. But what I wanted to get at is the comics are clearly marketed toward our age group now. You can, mm -hmm. you can pick up almost any book on the stand and it's marketed toward us first and other age groups second, mm -hmm. um, by and large. But it's interesting to see how the stereotype still hasn't been broken that comics are for kids. I guess that has to do with the fact that comic, that comic books aren't really, they're more of a, a an underground medium. I mean, it, it, they're not like movies that are just marketed like everywhere. It, like they're the, the trailers for movies are on twenty four seven on every television, but comic books they don't really have that type of marketing. And so, if you're not in the know of the comic book medium, then you you and you're completely ignorant of the fact. Then all you really have to go on is this, you know, stereotype of all oh, comic books, this boom bang, you know, comic books are just for kiddies. But, mm -hmm. but the thing is, I, I don't know. I, I guess most uh, comic book readers. I I don't know if this is true or not, but uh, I don't know. Just. I am a comic book reader that doesn't really give a damn uh, of what other people think of him because if I, if people say all oh, comic books are just for kids, all I really have to give them is you know I don't know a Watchmen or a V for Vendetta, just, just some one of those comic books that everybody brings up like oh comics are just for kids, and just would have them read that and and have that person look at that and say oh well that's the the writing level the the amount of quality in in the writing and the art is you know a lot more than I expected. And then after that, you know, if they're interested, I'll we'll have a bit of a bit of a chat and say like, it's not all just for kids. This is just you know, it's a it's an actual medium. You can do really anything with comic books. All it really is it's pictures and words put together. But uh, besides that, I guess there's a certain level of um, well, I don't know what's the right word I'm looking for. People. Uh, like Ziploc Gory, I believe that's this name. He, has, I guess, I don't just general comic book readers have this kind of a inferiority complex. It's kind of they get really defensive about the fact, like, oh, comic books are not for kids. Look at this. This guy's head's been ripped off. And I think you should really be um, more chillaxed about it. You know, don't worry about it. Well, can you answer my question from earlier? How old were you when you started reading comics? If you can. Oh. If you don't remember the exact age, you can give us a range. Okay. Well, let's see. I, I was really interested. When I was a kid in Russia, uh, growing up, um, we used to love these bat, like Tim Burton movies and and the um and the like the uh, the Batman animated series cartoons that were dubbed in Russian. Um, and when I got and I used to love the fact like Batman. Wow. And then when I got into Australia, I think I was about eight, maybe nine like eight nine or ten maybe just around that age age area i got my very first comic books and i remember opening in uh, no, no the thing is at my primary school there was a uh, my teacher had this giant collection of old 80s superman titles at the very back wall just like old like 1970s you know horror movie magazines and superman titles and and stuff like that and i used to love them so much and i that's why i love Superman. I don't give a shit about the mullet. I just love, I love them. <laughs> and it just, I read those, I read Superman, I read the Golden Guardian, I read those old, you know, 1970s horror spook magazines, um, and I just, I, 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 there was a, such a feeling of um, wonderment there. And I, I think it was about eight, yeah, eight, eight or nine. See, that's interesting, because I'm really on the opposite end of that. You were still fairly young, you know. It was very formative for you. Mm. Whereas I, like, I, I don't know if I, oh, I told Ed this story before, but I didn't tell you. The very first time, like, I read a comic or two growing up, but I never read comics growing mm. up when I was very young. But when I was 15, late 15, like, it would have been September or October, of my 15th year and I'm born in November so that gives you kind of an idea mm -hmm. 
there's this um there there was this dollar theater mm. in the local shopping center really close to my house. <clears throat> and on Wednesdays they would play movies for fifty cents. Mm. And it's two thousand five when I'm fifteen and I go to see Batman Begins for fifty cents. And I was so blown away by how good a movie it was that I'd never really thought of Batman like that. I mean, I'd watched a little bit of the television shows, but I never really got into them because I find with a lot of animated shows I, that you have to kind of get into a mood for it. But mm-hmm. So I watched Batman Begins, and I remember walking out of the library that day, or walking out of the movie store, or walking out of the movie theater, and going to the library and reading Batman comics. And that's what really first got me into it. And I kind of lulled a little bit until Dark Knight came out, which just sparked it. And that's what's made me so comic book, was the Dark Knight. Um, so really, I didn't get into comics until I was 15, almost 16 years old. Almost, you know, a whole eight, a whole eight years after you got into them. So I'm, I'm really on that opposite end. I'm on the end of the people uh, I'm on the end of getting attracted to it when you're older. Mm. And I've heard a lot of people say you're not going to get into it if you don't get into it when you're young. And I, I that, guess that's I'm... That's not true. Against... That's not true. That's the thing. That's how you can tell that the comic book medium is an actual medium. You, there's every there's there's a level of quality in every age uh, in, for everyone. Comics should be for everyone. There should be kids. Uh, there should be comics that, that are all audiences. Anyone can read in comic books for kids and uh, comic books for adults and comic books for everyone. I, that's what I want comic books to be for everyone. And like, and back to my uh, um, to my first experience of comic books. See, I remember opening up a particular Superman comic book, and just there was just like this feeling of just amazement. It's like you know, it's really hard to explain. You know, when you open up a page, uh, like open up a, a two-page spread. And there's just such a magnificent, iconic image of Superman flying at you, and mm-hmm. you just go, "Wow!" Just, just, just the like, just gee whiz, comic book joy. And like, and then like, I, I kind of stopped reading comic books for a while because you know I, I didn't have any comic book shops around me, so I, I comic books sort of had this uh, like almost idyllic um, place in my mind. Like I, I, I couldn't get to comic books as, as readily as I could. But they always had this kind of majesty in my mind, this kind of like, wow, comic books, they're, they're, they're so amazing because they were so rare to me. But when I do, when, whenever I got my hands on a comic book, it was like a special day. Like I used to get comic books for my birthday and, and I was like, wow, I got three new comic books there, Spider-Man and the Beast and Gambit all teamed up in one issue. Wow, golly, gee, wowzers, you know? So, <laughs> so anyway, so... And so that's when I started to draw comic books. I got uh, go I went to my library and I got books on how to draw comic books. And I started researching the medium. I started watching that those documentaries, you know, the superhero unmasked on YouTube. Just these long summarizations of the whole history of comic book publications in America, and just the whole history of a superhero. And I just I find the history of comic books just fascinating. And just as another thing. I see comic books, these whole comic book universes, as like this ultimate um, piece of pop cultural art. It's just like this whole thing, this whole decades long fictional paper universe is like this ultimate piece of pop art. And it's just, I I find it to be so magnificently uh, interesting and I love it so much. And I, that's why I, I love comic books now. I, you know, you know, it's great. Like older readers are reading comic books. That's fantastic. But I think it's um, it's an impractical decision to just have nothing for the kids to read. I mean, I I, I know you anyone can get into comic books, but it's just I, I want the, those uh, all ages books that you know uh, guys like us can pick up and enjoy, and guys and kids other like younger kids can pick up and enjoy, and. Uh, that's another thing. 
whenever I hear like a kid talk, like a younger kid at the comic book store talking about like, oh man, the Sinestro Corps War is so cool. Like all these all multicolored green lanterns and the red lanterns. And it's just, mm-hmm. when I overhear that, it's just like, it, it makes me smile. It makes me like, oh, kids are reading comic books. That's actually a really good point for me to jump in here. Cause I was just going to say, I feel like a lot of comics get, um, a bad rap for being, you know, not kid-friendly, and I feel like Green Lantern over the past couple of years has been a really good example of a neutral yeah. kind of book. Um, one thing I've said about Johns' writing on Green Lantern is when you just hear the concept, it sounds like utter trash. Well, just like when you hear the... No, no, hold on, hold on. Like when you hear the pitch for what this story is about. Like, if I were to just pitch Blackest Night, here it is. Like, this is the bare bones of that story all the other colors are gonna have lanterns now and they're all gonna fight each other and then eventually have to fight black lanterns it sounds like it's out of an action figure plot or like it's it's off of a of a stupid video game or, or something silver kids age. just made. silver age. no not even silver age it doesn't it sounds so kitty but then when you see the execution of it and how well it's done it not only appeals to adults, but it gets that that just raw awesomeness that you have as a kid with just that giddiness of, yeah, that's cool. And like I feel like Green <laughs> Lantern does a fantastic job of, of cementing both of those things um, it, throughout the run. And I mean, it's gotten a little iffy over the last 12 issues. Um, we can argue back and forth about that, but it's been fairly consistent. Um, New 52 maybe a little bit of a bumpy road, but with mm. just personally speaking with GL number zero that just came out this week, fantastic book. I'm I feel like you know this they're starting to get back to something. Uh, I feel like with the new 52 they they're kind of retreading stuff that they just finished wrapping up before new 52. So mm. Mm. we'll we'll see. But my point is that I feel like Green Lantern is a really good example of that. I feel like the Batman books, not all of them obviously, but I feel like um what Morrison was doing wasn't incredibly violent on screen. I mean, some of the undertones were obviously extremely violent, um, going back to Rip and everything that he was building up to before that and, and up to Ink as well. Mm. But I feel like overall there were, it was a very good callback to Silver Age, which is obviously much more kid-friendly. Yeah, the thing is that I really liked about the Morrison Batman stuff, it, it, it embraced that kind of, you know, uh, pop zap pow kind of, you know, the, the pop art aesthetics of the Batman, uh, like the 60s Adam West TV show, but added like this really dark David Lynch underpinnings to it. And but you, so, so you had this kind of like light, you know, not light, but it, it's like colors in the dark, I'd like to call it. Just like these mm. bright colors in the dark. And yeah, just... and like, I mean, that's the thing about Morrison's work is it's so... I, I did a video a while back about why I love Grant Morrison's stuff, and... I still hold to that is he can just create these entire worlds in two lines of dialogue. Indeed, indeed. And it just it's so complex and so comic booky. Like he writes for the people that have been reading comic books either for several years or have been reading several years worth of comic books. Um mm. to throw myself into that category because like I approach comic books not just saying, "Oh, I can go pick up what's on the stand and I'll be fine." No, I went and read as many of the archives as I could in the library, and then I downloaded thousands of them. Like, I have read every single issue of Detective Comics between 200 and 700. Damn. Because of scans. Yes, and I don't remember all of them. Um, but I've read all of them. I promise say, you that. Say, do you have the, um, the 70s um, Neil Adams, you know, Denny O'Neill stuff? I got it somewhere on my computer. I won't really remember a lot of it oh but uh, okay but you know once we're done with this could you send a few over my way please <laughs> sure okay um, anyway so so yes that's the thing about back to the subject of just these outra- outlandish plots uh, in comic books see it's really strange you know when you try to, uh, to describe them to somebody who is not a, a versed in the comic book medium, they, they that's what I guess that's where they get like what different multiple colors, you know. Yeah, I mean, like that's the thing is when 
I remember before I got into Green Lantern, I was sitting there looking at the trades and I go, oh my god, Rainbow Lanterns now? Really, guys? You're going to tell me this is good? And the guy behind the counter, you know, Chad at the comic book store, he goes, Ian, read the first trade. And if you do not love it, I will let you return it. I will let you return a trade, which we never do. I was like, okay, fine. So I read the, um, God, I can't remember the name of it. The one that brings Hal Jordan back. Mm -hmm. And even though I had no idea what was going on, it was so cool. <laughs> and it was so well done. Oh my God. It just, it worked on every level. And it That's... was fantastic. And I, like, came back in the next day, and guess what? I bought the second volume of John's Run. And then, the like, week after that, like, for a week, for several weeks, during my, when I went to pick up my pole, I would buy the next volume of the Green Lantern Run. You know, that's a thing. You can't really do that kind of a thing. Well, I guess you can, because the Avengers proved it. You can't really... Uh, comic books have this amazing power of just taking these outlandish concepts that would take like a billion dollars in like CGI effects to render on screen and just uh, if, if you skew into the right artist and then the, and the right writer they can take these like insane silver agey ideas and just def and just re and just what's the right word I'm looking for um, add this whole new structure and dimension to it that it just it works so well in comic books like and it's so hard to pull off the right mood and the right atmosphere and the right and the right it's really hard to get it on film but when you, when you do you get stuff like the avengers just this really fun romp but mm -hmm. you know but comic books still have that fun romp aspect still have that fun avengers you know bound pal like punch the alien in the face but they also have this layer of um, really complex uh, inter inter interreferential um, continuity and and just, just this is the, the certain comic books come up you know serious comic books uh, storytelling like Green Lantern they're very layered you can appreciate them on multiple level, levels just like you get the whole whiz pow god golly gee wowzers multicolored lanterns. The, the red ones spew blood everywhere and it's awesome and it's just you get that feeling of a kid and get you but yes but yet you have this other layer of just like wow this is a really great complex interweaving story and yeah i mean that's what's so admirable about it is he's yeah. been building it for years and then when you got to the delivery it was fantastic yeah. and there was so it was so character driven at the end i mean there was that you know impending doom prophecy kind of thing going for it but it just kept all like it was it was an oedipus story in that the the um prophecy only became only came true because of the actions of the of the characters it became a self-fulfilling prophecy it was a self-fulfilling prophecy yes yeah, that's an interesting thing you can also explore these you know you know what i really love about comic books they take this kind of these really you know basic really corely human mythological themes like revenge and and greed and uh, like the oedipus stuff and just they redefine it into, into into a modern age you know tv doesn't really do that well i guess it does you know game of thrones but uh, that really rarely happens but you get it's like comic books they retell classic human stories I mean, that's why tell... they're called modern myths. It's exactly it's the same yeah. mythological stories. It's just now that we finally recognize this as complete fiction, we're able to do so much more with it and then actually exactly. use it as metaphorical political commentary and stuff Indeed. as well, which is another thing that, I mean, here's where it's getting really adult in a different way than I feel like the stereotypical comic books are for adults now, is we have all this meta commentary on the way our world works. Yeah. And it's, Fascinating. I mean, people have written, myself included, philosophical and political papers all around comic books. I mean, Watchmen's the obvious one, but of course you got Dark Knight Returns. You got yeah. Um, the death of Superman inspired a lot of political intrigue. Mm. And then every so often something comes up 
in the medium that just shocks the rest of the world and they feel the need to report on it. Um, probably the biggest one uh, in my mind recently was when that um, little miniature story about Superman giving up his American citizenship came yeah. out. That really sparked a lot of debate. Just, you know, people were boycotting DC and stuff. It, it was just very, very interesting. And it was, it was this great political intrigue that you'd never expect from the medium, but we should know to expect from the medium because of what it's been evolving into over the last 70 years. Mm. And the thing is, with uh, with the popularity of comic books, uh, do you think that if comic books became uh, more mainstream, like movies and television, that um, people would, uh, they would the actual uh, story content would get a little bit le- a little bit diluted to appeal to a to a mass audience? Um, I feel like that has happened. I feel like they're trying to make the stories a little more simplistic in some cases in order to appeal to bigger audiences. And I think a lot of people will cite a lot of new 52 books for doing just that. Like what? And I cannot, I cannot um, say no. I can say that I disagree, but I cannot say that these points are not valid. Hmm. Um, you know, that's, that's a big complaint I've been hearing is there's all this change for the sake of change. But the thing is, it's not change for the sake of change. It's change for the sake of getting people interested in the medium just to get people interested in the medium. Indeed. And that's certainly needed. I just don't know if the way they're doing it is the correct way to go about it. Mm. Uh, what what books do you think that are getting overly simplified? Just just a curiosity sake. <sighs> um, man, Detective was for a little bit there. Now that Daniel's off the book, I'm hoping it's going to get a little bit grittier again. Mm. Um... What was it that I was reading the other day? Uh, the the DC Universe Presents I quit reading because it was getting so just, look at us, look at us, this is mainstream now. That got annoying. Uh, Superman I haven't heard anything good about since it started. Really? I, yeah. I like the Superman stuff. Now I'm, are you talking Superman or are you talking action? Um, both Superman and Action. I like. I've I like. Heard, I've heard good things about Action. I've been reading Action, but I've heard terrible things about Superman. Um, I'm trying to. There's Flash got so bland. Really? I, I quit reading Flash. I dropped Flash because it was obviously just trying to, you know, get attention, and it was doing a bunch of really stupid stuff. Uh Red Hood and the Outlaws is on my cut line right now. Um, those those are some of the things. I know Suicide Squad's trying to, like, dance on that line of, um, you know, really super risque, and it's okay, but I'm thinking of dropping that, too, sadly. Mm. I don't I, I Flash, I think, is a, a great thing you can give to, like, a younger reader. Yeah, Flash maybe is for younger kids, but it's just not very... It wasn't very interesting. It's... It was telling the same story over and over again, which got really annoying within two arcs. Mm. Um, but it just, it wasn't doing anything new. It was just doing these repetitive things in uh, different ways to try to, you know, get people on the book. Like, oh, now he's traveling back in time again, even though we just did a whole giant event about why he should never be traveling through time. Mm. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh. <laughs> anyway, um, goodness, back to the subject of um, kids uh, and the darker content. Um, I don't know. It's, it, I, I guess the real thing that really sparked this off is what they did with Captain Marvel. That's his name, by the way, not fucking Shazam. That's the word he says to turn into Captain Marvel. It's like, oh, Captain Marvel, because I love Captain Marvel. I think he's the ultimate shamanic superhero. He says a magic word, and a magical bolt of lightning comes from the heavens and turns him into, into the ultimate enlightenment figure. Like, ah, uh, Captain Marvel. I love Captain Marvel. But I, I don't know. It's just the, the thing with Captain Marvel, you've got to have a lighthearted tone with Captain Marvel. You, I'm not saying you should have, like, you know, you know completely, you know, you should have a more of a fanciful tone with Captain Marvel, and it's just, 
I don't know. Just I've been uh, looking through the uh, uh, Captain Marvel has been the back the backstory of uh, the um, the new in the Justice League books, um, and um, I don't know. It's just I dig the kind of um, the you know Black Adam's redesign and I. I, yeah, I, I quit guess... reading the Captain Marvel backups because it just got annoying. I just yeah. didn't care. I wanted more Justice League story. I didn't care about Captain Marvel. Oh, ooh, I. The thing is with me, like I did Captain Marvel, and I guess uh, for a second, for a while there, I thought they were going for kind of a you know Goonies, you know, not, not like that, like eighties. Uh, what's the word? Right word? Um, kind of a, like like a dark eighties uh, like kid movie film mystery thing. Uh, but I don't know. It just it got into the point where it was just like a guy's head gets melted off with lightning, and it's just. It's like Captain Marvel should be well. It should be in one of those all ages books, not not to compl- not like something bland and and like not not. Uh, the thing is, when I mean all ages and for kids, I, people keep to, keep expecting me to mean like you know silly you know simplistic stupid stories, but that's not it. Kids are pretty smart. P- kids can take some really you know dark stuff you know, but the thing is with that. You've got to. There's a there's a limit. You can't just. Uh, I don't know. I don't like the direction that uh, that uh, Captain Marvel is going. I don't like the fact that it made him all gritty and 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 frowning all the time. And and, and, and it's no, it's Captain Marvel. I mean, you, you don't do that. You don't badassify Captain Marvel. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. Like I said, I just I quit reading the Captain Marvel backups for the exact reason I was talking about earlier. They're doing stuff just to change stuff, and I got tired of it. I mean, I I just I don't care. Like all, you already have a character I don't care about in a book I'm interested in, so I'm really annoyed um, because you're cutting out of my story from the book that I bought to read these characters to throw in this stuff about this guy I don't like. Like I've never really cared about Captain Marvel. I there. I said it. Grab your torches and pitchforks, okay? Um, relax, guess, man. Relax. Um, no, but no, it's I, fine. I'm just, I'm just saying. I, I don't care about Captain Marvel, and it, it bugged me. And they, DC's been doing a lot of that. But we, we're, we're kind of like not in exactly. I think, I think we're kind of on a topic similar to what we're trying to talk about, but we're not really there. I want to kind of dig this in a little deeper, and and let's talk about what is being done in comics that is definitely not for kids in modern comics, all right? Mm, I guess, um, I'm not sure. See, it's really strange, because you have certain titles that uh, are more, mostly geared toward older, ca- to older readers, like Catwoman, like there's a lot of, uh, I don't know. Sex like, and uh, stuff e- like that. E- literally, a yeah, yeah, like that, like with Catwoman. Like, you know, you got a hot, you know, Ex hooker girl who's dressed in the skin tight, um, you know, latex suit, and that's I love that, you know, like hell yeah, you know, it's fun. How did great. I know Milan would be the one to bring up the latex suit? And the... Shut up, shut up, shut up. She's shut up. But the thing about the Catwoman, I people have been uh, complaining, like, oh my god, do they showed her having sex with Batman? And for me, I, I was the only man when I heard about that, yeah, I was going like. Fuck yes, man! Finally, they've been hinting at it for like years now, and I'm like, you know what? I want to see it. I just want to see that, and just to verify the fact that Batman and Catwoman are doing their pedonka dogs on the rooftops. And it's like, yes, they are. And it's like, yes, they are having sex on the rooftops. And it's like, yes, that is that is a fact confirmed. Well, here's the thing about that. Actually, in Batman Inc., right before the reboot. A relaunch. There was definitely a scene with Batman and Catwoman where they were staying in the same hotel room, in one bed in this other country. You know, with Bruce Wayne and Selina Kyle. Mm. And I mean, it was very obvious. It through subtext. I mean, it was subtextually there. They were obviously sleeping together. So, did you need that sex scene, or can it? Can more writers? Right, like that, where it's working on two levels, where you don't need to see the gratuitous detail of it, but you can still have the actual confirmation. Yes, the, you, that's the thing. You can have the sub, the, the whole sex scene. That was just you no, know, 
when I opened it, when I actually heard about it and looked at it myself, I was like, God damn, they actually did it. But the thing is, y yes, you can have, you can explore um, darker themes and like, you know, yes, these people are, you know, doing the dirty in the bed. But um, y y the thing is, there's a, there's a level where you don't actually show, like in a Captain Marvel backup, a man's face literally burning off and seeing all the, you know, gratuitous detail of his, like, cheek muscles fizzing and, bur and his eyeballs bursting, you know... You can you can just lower the camera and just show his feet dangling and and just okay. Light. Well, here's a question. Yeah. Then. Um, is it the gratuitous detail? Is it the graphic nature of these books that is the problem, or is the content itself problematic? Because we can look back at comics from before the comics code, and they were arguably just as graphic, if not more so, than now. Yes, I and know that they glorified those up actions in some cases but nowadays wow. it seems that the tone is so much darker just in general it seems like there's this this overwhelming negativity and this this grime that's been added to the world of comic books just anywhere even mm. in books like superman yeah that's the thing it's a certain line where yes you can have dark you know disturbing themes but you can't really have that theme, you know, those darker themes, you know, completely swallow the the, the fun of comic books. I mean, you got to have the fun, and it, it, the, see, if you just have the dark underpinnings and just the dark, gritty shit, always, it, it ceases to be, like, you know, interesting. It ceases, like, oh, yes, you know, this girl will get raped in the ass, and you know, it, it come, uh, superheroes yeah, should have... Yeah. What? Dude, 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 Infinity Cry. No, never mind. You can, you can have dark uh, uh, underlining themes, but they shouldn't be so... They shouldn't have... They shouldn't permeate the books to the level that they do. I mean, like, I don't mind darker themed stories. That's, I uh, love me some Justice League Dark and, and, and Animal Man and Swamp Thing, but... You shouldn't have... Well, yeah, I don't know, with characters that don't require so much darkness, like Superman or, or Captain Marvel, you shouldn't go, you shouldn't have to, uh, you know, 90s them up, you know? Um, did you read the, uh, Detective Annual? Uh, yeah, right. the no, one... my bad, my bad, the Detective Number Zero. Uh, the one with Black Mask? No, no, that's the Annual, I'm talking about Detective Zero. Detective Zero, um, I've got it, but I haven't really read through it yet. Okay, well... Do you hate, are you going to hate me if I spoil the ending? Oh, no, no, go ahead. I'm going to read it anyway. Okay, well, it ends with a very, very negative tone. And honestly, the message of the story is do not love people. Like, honestly, that is, that is the lesson Batman is to walk away with at the end of that story, is do not love people because literally they will stab you in the back. And... So there's a very negative tone that you would never... Like, I, I wouldn't let a child read this book based on the images in it, but more so, I wouldn't let a child read that book based on the themes, the fundamental... Exactly. ...of do not trust, do not love, do not care about others. Mm -hmm. That's a good lesson to learn. Whether or not you take it to heart and let it apply to you, that's a good lesson to learn, but I would never let a child read that. Exactly. So here's the thing. What is the line where where is it where does it border into the dark tone is uh, the darker tone the darker themes are okay for a more adult audience in mind but the what's on page is not graphic is not disturbing where where is the line between that and what is on page is not only disturbing but the message itself is disturbing i don't know it's strange you see there's no... we're talking about Green Lantern, and that was that's definitely in the category of the themes are a bit darker, and and there's there's significant character overtones that are on the negative side or on the dark side, but it's clearly something you'd be okay with a child reading, maybe minus the cuss words here and there. Mm. But then we go over to things like Detective and what they've been doing, or or what what Batman and Robin was doing for a while, and you just would never ever let a child read that because it's just it's horrifying not not only the graphic images on the page but but the 
the content of the messages that are being sent out. Mm. Never let a child read that. So where is yeah. here? But the thing is, with uh, I guess it has to. Um, it, it is a very strange line. But the thing is, with Batman, you you, you expect some darker things, you know, because it's Batman. You know, his parents were shot, gunned down in front of him. You 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 would expect some darker themes, but I don't know, like. If it was like somebody like, that's why I have a problem with like that type of like you know don't trust anybody. The whole misery. Oh, well, here, 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 hold on, hold on. Here, uh, let's let's get off of the character like Batman then. Let's go to someone like Wonder Woman. Exactly. Who's genuinely, or generally, genre, generally Gen- considered to be a very hopeful and and very optimistic, uplifting character who is considered a role model for women. And young girls, who is always, like, it's always encouraged for young girls to read her book. Mm. It's always been as far as I can tell. Mm. And yet, here we have, not only in New 52, but previous to that, going back to, I don't know, I'm going to say, um, Infinite Crisis, when she chopped off a guy's head. Like, where did she go over the line as to what is okay? I mean, I was reading Gail Simone's run, which is fantastic, by the way, but that's something I wouldn't let a child read. Yeah, the thing is... The, the, the graphic on the page, once again, is shocking in and of itself, but the messages in the book are horrifying, even though they end up coming out to a very positive overall message in the end. But throughout the journey, it's not... It's not something you'd let a child read. So, like, is it the character, or is the character not immune? Is there a is there an objective line between this is okay, this is not, or is it purely on a case by case basis? I suppose um, I suppose it can be on a case by case basis. But the thing is, with certain, uh, you cut me off when I was about to say something. With um, character, uh, it's fine. With characters like Captain Marvel and um, Superman, I mean Captain Marvel to take him back. Uh, like you expect darker themes from Batman. You know, Batman is the dark character. That's in his nature. His symbol is the bat. But with characters that don't, uh, that you see, it's like, it's like, what's the what's the right analogy? It's like making the not not the Care Bears. Um, it's you can't. Certain characters are by their very nature positive characters, like Captain Marvel. They, it, it, he's a very positive, very uplifting, very, you know, for me he embodies the whole G whiz like comic book, uh, like the whole, the whole comic books are for younger readers and for everyone. Like everyone can, uh, for a, a Captain Marvel title, anyone should pick up a Captain Marvel title and enjoy it because it, it should be optimistic. But you know, you sh- it's like, I don't know, it's it's like they're shooting themselves in the foot with you know badassifying Captain Marvel with making him darker and just adding these, you know, ridiculously dark themes to a character that never before in his whole history of, you know, comic book, in his whole history, never really, he, he wasn't def- defined by that. He, I'm sure there was some, I know, darker themes in the, you know, in, in Countdown and, and Final Crisis, but those were just, you know, horrible, you know, universes ending type events. Um, but, See, the character in themselves is not a dark character, so you can't really. It does. It, it's like, what if you made um, a character like I don't know. Think of a light-hearted character like um, Kid Flash, um, and give him like you know, may, may, or no, no, you know, here's a good, here's a good uh, description. Speedball, the Speedball character in the in Marvel. You 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 had this fun team of teenage superheroes. And then, you know, a superhero blew up and killed 600 kids and all the teammates of this character. So Speedball, you know, started cutting himself and starting wear, starting wear, started to wear this, you know, dark colored gimp suit with spikes on the inside. And it's just... Oh, it, him, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, like that. And it's just like... It, it's... It, it, sure, the, the kind of... Uh, the, the, in that story, I don't know, it, it's strange. You had these lighthearted characters and then all of a sudden... You know, this horrifying tragedy happens, and it's just like it's like it's like real in these light-hearted books. When something horrible like that happens, that never really nothing that horrible has ever 
ever been introduced in these type of runs in these books. It's like if you add these, it's like when you have these very lighthearted runs, these very lighthearted romps, and you just add in all the, the like out of the blue, these horrifying real world issues, like in these stories that never really had that or never really hinted to that. It, it, it's kind of like a, 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 a two of a, it's a very unnecessary shift in tone. It's like, oh, yay, piff, bam, pow, superheroes is fun. Oh, now, oh my God, a bomb blew up and, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of kids are dead and it's all your fault. See, here's an interesting thing there. You seem to be complaining about this, but no, you got I'm not remember... complaining about it. It's just. Well, no, you seem to be bringing it up as something negative that happened in comics. But what you've got to remember is things were being praised for those dramatic shifts in tone. Mm. For example, one of the most famous covers ever is, of course, yeah, Green Speedy. Lantern lecturing Green Arrow as Speedy shoots fucking heroin. Yeah. Right? That is like, and Speedy and Green Arrow, I mean, just the names, those don't sound like a character to be shooting heroin. Well, Speedy and, is. Speedy well, no, is. I mean, yeah, yeah, true, true. <laughs> Don't. Um, yeah. oh, but it okay. doesn't sound like it's it's speedy, yeah. But it's it's so it was so dramatic and, and it changed the medium forever. No yeah. argument whatsoever there. So what, what's really interesting is is that the start of it? Is is there a line? Is like what makes it okay for it to be done in one case when it's political or social commentary? But not in another one. It's is it is it just because sometimes it's political commentary and other times because it's just darkness for the sake of darkness. Yeah, that's the thing. Even if it is, is that not art? Is not doing something dark purely for the sake of having it be dark an expression of the artistic medium? And is it okay for us to criticize that? The thing is, um, um, damn, I should write that down. That's good. That is really good. You know, that's really great. But anyway, um, the thing about that. I love the whole, you know, speedy shooting up thing. That's fine. But the thing is, the story, the run itself, uh, ta tackled some really serious subjects at the time, like overpopulation, you know, the corruption of government, stuff like that. Yeah, you would expect that in that run. Sure, it was dark and terrifying, but that was the whole point. But the thing is, um, I know, um, yes, you, you can add darker things. You know, you know, you could say that's art and things that are normally lighthearted, but... The, the story itself wasn't really a light-hearted story. You know, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, they were tackling serious subjects, but they still had that kind of, you know, like, hey, look, we're superheroes, but we're, you know, getting shot up with heroin and stuff like that. But I'm not complaining about it. I'm just, it, I'm just, what's the right word? I'm just bringing these things up. You know what? Devil's you Advocate. Devil's playing. Advocate, yeah. Devical. I'm de I've been playing Devil's Advocate, just complaining and so just pointing the things, these things out, but keep talking. I gotta go pee. Okay, um, that's an interesting thing to say in the middle of recording. Here on Geeky Gentlemen, we are completely professional in every way. That's why you can hear crickets in the background, and that's why Milan is is going to take a restroom break. We're gonna cut now to commercial. Except I don't, I don't have advertisers. I totally need advertisers. Ah. Uh, Sorry, that just really threw me for a loop. Um, the point he was making there, I, I do find interesting, though. Um, when I say darkness for the sake of darkness as an expression of art, I've, I've heard of the, the story of Cannonball that he was talking about. I'm going to use that as an example, having not read it. And I'm going to attempt to make an argument based on that. The story of Cannonball seemed like it was taking something that was genuinely happy and carefree and go lucky, and it did something horrifying for the sake of making a darker character out of a light-hearted character. And that's certainly interesting, but more so than that is it borders on art because you are now entering a level of artistic expression within the changing of a character and with the creation of something very unique within the character, even within the superhero genre. And I feel that's very important to, to talk about, and I feel like that breaks ground. So here's the other question that, like, here's, this I suppose is the question we keep circling around. I'm back. Is breaking ground an excuse for darkness, or is darkness 
part of what's necessary to break ground. The thing is, I, if you look through the history of comics, uh, especially in the 80s and 90s, um, well, in certain er periods therein, there was this kind of um, almost, especially in the early 2000s, you know, 9-11, there was a real vein of just of just very sinister, what's the right word? Not sinister. Uh, not Yeah, I just this very dark, I'm just... Nihilism? Nihilism, cynicism, just, just darkness for the sake of darkness. See, I have no problem with darker themes added, but it's just how you deal with them. There is, um, there was this vein of just mean-spiritedness and just darkness for the sake of darkness in comic books for a while there. But the thing is, they they tackled it in ways that was really kind of immature it was like what it was like a like a dumbass 16 year old tackling the the nature of um be like nihilism and just being like oh everything is shit so i'm gonna act like an asshole because everything doesn't matter but like but you you're a nihilist and you're a cheery nihilist anti-conventional existential nihilism yes yes see you go about these things in a sensible way but when you take a tone that's just cynicism, cynicism for the sake of cynicism and not for the sake of actually talking about the subject, um, it, sometimes it can get overplayed and it's just, it's gotten to the point with me where it's like seeing an optimistic book, seeing an optimistic outcome, it's so much more like, wow, so things turn out well and that's the thing about comics that I love. You can, even through the darkest hour, through the darkest night, you always know well, you don't know, you know characters might die, but you know that's the thing about superheroes. They always, you know, help you through the darkness and, you know, leave you okay and, you know, in the light on the other side. Hmm. I'm not saying, but you, you can have dark things with Batman, and sure, you can add darker themes and, you know, in different characters, sure, but not to the point where, I guess there's a, the thing is with comic books, yes, they are art. But the thing is, they're also a commercial medium. Hmm. So, so it's a very interesting dichotomy. You got like these comic book stories that I would consider to be art, but also, you know... They were made for a commercial purpose. Exactly. Um, see, my personal opinion is that the highest forms of art are the ones that are done... Um, is, is art that is done purely for the sake of itself with little to no personal recognition or fiscal gain. I feel those are the highest forms of art when they can be classified under that. And that is why bathroom vandalism is the highest form of artistic expression. That being said... That is so true, my friend. Exactly. Let, let, me, let me applaud you. You Thanks. know, one thing before we move on. I was... You see, I was at this bathroom... Um, in this college that I was visiting, and I sat, you know, you know, to do my business, and I closed the door and I locked it, and I see this giant dick drawn on the wall, and on the shaft of the dick is written "Bon Appetit." See, I like bathroom art that's really clever. Um, like yeah. once I sat down in a stall, and I look at the door in front of me, and it says "Now for a round of bathroom tennis." Quick, look left. So I look left. And on the wall left to me, it says, quick, look right. So I look right, and on the wall right to me, it says, quick, look left. And so you go back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. <laughs> it's, it's honestly really clever. And then there, there are other things where you see poetry um, on the bathroom walls. And sometimes it's good poetry, and sometimes it's, it's mocking poetry of, of people that leave poems on bathroom walls. Like, here I sit, all brokenhearted, came to shit, yet only farted. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, that to me is art in its highest form, albeit not its most prestigious form, Indeed. but its highest, purest form to me. And I feel comics can do that because I feel that there are always going to be comics that are incredibly impactful and they might carry personal recognition or financial gain after they've been created. But before that, they were not created for that purpose. They were created Indeed. as a work of art. Yes, the thing is, that, that, that is very true. And the thing is, and, and it's just, it's interesting that comics have that, like, very uh, divided dichotomy. I mean, 
Watchmen. Sure, Alan Moore was, you know, all, you know, look at this young, new British art, like, British writer, you know, making Swamp Thing all, you know, all, all grown up and such. And they said, oh, I'm going to tackle the whole subject of superheroes. And everybody went like, oh, yeah, that's cool. That's nifty what it's going to be about. And it was like, oh, I'm going to use the old Charlton characters and like stuff like that. And then you figure out, like, oh, he can't use them. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's probably going to be okay. But, yeah, you, we don't know. What's it called again? Watchmen? What does that mean anyway? So when it finally comes out, you let you read through it. And it's like, well, son of a bitch. This is redefining the medium, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> Because that was everyone's exact thought as they went to put... (laughs) Um, (laughs) I don't know. Uh, We're we're in rocky territory here because we can't claim to know what someone was intending as they made something. And Alan Moore is a particularly tough subject because constantly the man will produce something that's genius then say, ah, it's crap, after the fact, and, you know, scorn fans of his work, a uh, prime example, of course, being The Killing Joke. Um, I don't know. I don't want to try to put words in anyone's mouth. The thing is with that, it, it's really interesting, you know, because um, being an artist myself, like uh, at least dr- drawing-wise, I draw something, and I think it's like, I, I at first I like how it looks, then I like I find little, you know, inconsistencies or little, you know, like details that I don't like in it, and then I show it to somebody and I go, hey, what do you think of that? It's crap, and and they go, like, wow, this is amazing. I don't know. I guess it's it has to do with the fact, like, if you created something, an artist would all would constantly um, criticize himself. It's like every little detail that you do. Um, it's set after it's done, and you look, read through it again, and you find like little inconsistencies, or not incons- not even inconsistencies, but little things that you, when you think back at it, you could have done to make it a little bit more better in your own eyes. But it, the thing about art, it, when after it's finished, it's set, it's done, it's out there. Especially with comic books, you can't really go back and you know t- tweak the endings or tweak the dialogue or tweak the art a little bit here and there. That's the whole thing. It's out there. People have bought it. People are reading it. People, it's a it's a mass market medium. Mm-hmm. But that's but, the thing about comics is it's such a hard thing to get together because you're mm-hmm. not unless you are a writer artist and you're good at both of them, you're not going to be able to get your own thing out there. You need the collaboration and then you need the distribution. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So it's it's such a hard thing to not be commercial. It's almost a requirement of the medium that it be commercial. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen on a large scale. The thing is, the thing about that. See, after after a work is done, and it's out there, and you when you read back through it, and you said, "Oh, I could have done this a little bit better. I could have done this a little bit better." Um, you can't really go back and you know redo the whole book and rechange everything. Unless uh, you're George Lucas. Indeed, you you know where I was going, didn't you? You knew where I was. Uh, you knew where I was heading. Um, you know me so well. But yeah, that's the whole thing. If you if you if you allow artists to do that, you get George Lucas. You get like you you get people who are just left redoing the same thing, adding things. I always to... I always think art is better when you can find someone. To be honest, I feel like when someone, when an artist is forced to focus their drive down to a set number of things, obviously there's a fine line here where you don't want to be too much, otherwise you're overbearing. You want to leave room for expression, but I find when an artist is forced to focus their work down to a narrow set of circumstances or a set of uh, requirements, that you get ultimately a much better um, piece than you do if you let an artist just have free reign. And I think the Star Wars movies are a great example of that. I think some of the things you see in comic books are a great example of that. uh, Before before you move on, can I just add a little something? You can can say that... that You got 30 seconds. Okay, okay. The thing with all short films, especially for our movie students, if you've been to movie school or to film school and you're being tasked like, okay, you got to make this film that it's about this long and it's about this subject and you can only use three words. And it's like those very, it's almost like a challenge. It's like, what kind of amazing artistic expression can I come, can I 
come up with with only using three words in a you know 25 mo- minute movie that's actually a really good point is you don't know where your where the line is between too much and too little uh, the, the guideline is- of your movie can only be five mi- minutes long is way too big sometimes sometimes it's way too small but sometimes when the guideline is you have to have a purple flower and the, the there has to be a man in a black suit with a white tie and and you have to have the words mother of god if it wasn't for my horse i wouldn't have spent that year in college in the book and then there has to be someone reading bean and time in the corner of the coffee shop it's just going to be crap because when you have to stagger and throw all that stuff in there it's gonna when you have all those regulations it's crap and that's why over regulation is a problem which a lot of artists in dc are complaining about right now is there's mm. over regulation by the company but at the same time like i just said i feel like lucas his first three star wars movies were fantastic because they were funneled through a certain number uh they, they had to jump through a certain number of hoops Mm. Whereas the newer ones, when he was George Lucas now, instead of George Lucas, when he was George Lucas, he could do anything. He could come on set and tell the interns to eat their own shit, and they would have done it and said, thank you, sir. There's just this, you know, power-hungry, just egotistical built up, and it just, it created crap because he could do Anything. anything no one was ever yeah. going to question him on it no one was ever going to tell him that he couldn't he couldn't do it and and that's why the films were so bad is because basic things like pacing just were completely ignored because he's george lucas he's a genius he knows what he's doing yeah and it's a little mean i i apologize for the mental image of interns eating their own shit though i'm sure that happened <laughs> anyway Goodness, what was I going to talk about? Yes, but the thing is, uh, you've got to have certain level. It's really, but the thing is, you it all has to do, in certain cases, it all really has to do with the artist, with the person himself. I mean, like, I, I know over-regulation, that's the problem, but if you have a certain little regulations, these certain little hoops that you got to jump through, and it really has to do with the artists themselves. I mean, like, you know, a, a mediocre guy would just, you know, jump through the hoops and come up with something all right, and it's fine, and it's, you know, it's dandy, but it's not a thing you'll remember after, like, a week or so. But with an, a certain guy, with a certain type of artist, and they 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 see these, you know, little hoops, these little, these little constrictions as a challenge. And they're mm-hmm. like, ooh, like, so I can't do this, this, and that? All righty then, I'll do this, this, and this, and this, and that to compensate for the things that I can't do this, this, and that. You know and what I mean? It's like it's like having those assignments back in high school. You always had the kids that would just do the assignment and turn in something bland, but then you'd have someone said, oh, I have to have a character named Jenny? Fine, I'm going to turn Jenny into a parody of what you're telling me to do. Or I'm going to take your concept and completely flip it on its head just to tell you shove it up your ass i don't like your concepts even though admittedly after the fact this this actually worked out really well for me so thank mm-hmm. you for your concept that i had to use <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's the thing it, it, it's almost um really fun if you have these little guidelines it really separates the men from the boys or from the mediocre artist to the guy that has potential mm-hmm well, I feel like we've gotten on a pretty good tangent, but I want to get back to the, the um, comics for the, the younger reader thing. And I feel like we should start wrapping up because this is our fifth track, so we're, we're approaching about an hour and 15 now. All right. Um, all right, so we've discussed the, the lines in Darkness, and I don't think that you really can come down, this is okay, this isn't okay. I feel it is a case-by-case basis, and that is indeed, obviously indeed. problematic for introducing young readers and mm. introducing even new readers to the topic, mm. because not everyone likes to open up a book and see, you know, heads being sliced off or, you know, overly sexualized women. You know, mm. some that, that really does turn some, re- some readers off. And there's a whole topic we didn't even discuss, which is women in comics. Mm. Maybe we can do that next time. Eh, we'll see. I got to... I get the next idea one, I think, and I've got a really good one, but we'll okay. see. Okay, but before that, before before we move on, the, uh, the thing about the women in comic books, I like it. Like I like the the Catwoman, uh, the Catwoman artist, the Catwoman title of the New Fifty Two artist wise is because he draws her 
like more like a real live woman. I mean, sure, she you know tits and ass is all great and, and all, but he draws her as a very muscular woman because she has real. It seems like she has that genuine weight in her shoulders. So when she punches somebody, you can actually see the muscles in her arms, and she can you can tell like yes, yeah, she is a physically fit enough. She's physically powerful enough to actually cause some damage to a grown man. She's a big girl, and yeah. I and I like that. Like when like. I believe it's called um, the New Frontier. The Dane, uh, Darwin is it Darwin Cook? Uh, but that that story where um, basically he's retelling the Silver Age. Uh, basically, um, Wonder Woman is taller than Superman. She's a really big, muscular girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's she's literally taller than Superman, and she's physically larger than him. And uh, yes, you know, you know, she lifts up cars and rips uh, like metal beams from buildings to beat up giant freaking yellow pterodactyl monsters. Yeah, she's got to be a big girl, and it's almost like this. Almost, um, I guess there's a certain true to lifeness. I like it when women are drawn. I mean, I love my tits and ass. Don't get me wrong, but it's a great thing to see. Like, okay, that's a realistically proportioned muscular arm for a female. But mm. anyway. I, that's like an artist tangent, anyway. Um, you were saying? Oh, I just I wanted to get back to you know, like women. I'm talking about just women reading comics more than women in comics mm-hmm. as characters. That's something that could just fill up a day, and I'd actually want a woman on that topic. No offense, Milan. Ah, uh, you're just not quite vagina having enough for for us to talk about this. And curse we, my so, not having the ovaries. Curses. Um, but let's let's talk about young readers, because I do feel that you and I are quite an interesting dynamic from what we were bringing up earlier. I got into comics when I was, you know, adolescence, teenager years, and have been into them ever since. I'm 21, mm-hmm. almost 22 now. And you got into comics when you were eight, nine years old, so mm-hmm. very, very young. So I feel what... You were brought in by the the awe and the scope of it, whereas I was brought in by the sheer surprise that you can do these wonderfully complex stories with these, to what I'd always assumed were atypical, you know, American fair characters that, you know, everyone knows, but no one really knows about. Mm. Uh, Because that's the thing, everybody knows Batman is Bruce Wayne. Everybody knows Clark Kent is Superman. But you can never get the average Joe off the street to tell you anything about Batman's character, about who he is, about what really motivates him. What motivates Batman? Oh, the death of his parents. No. You're wrong. There's so much more to it than that. That's just what started it. You can never get the average Joe off the street to tell you why Superman is the greatest superhero ever because they don't understand what makes a superhero truly great. And that's the thing is, I was so impressed by the themes, by the the complex mythology and the the ideals and the philosophy all driving it. Whereas you, from what you were explaining, were impressed by the the scope and the history and the the rich detail of it all and the, the intricacies of the world. You were infatuated by what not to be insulting or not to demean it, what would infatuate a child, whereas I was infatuated by what would infatuate an adult. Yeah, um, but the thing is, that's true, but the thing is, once you real, when you have that thing, it's really, when you have the childlike love of comic books, and you realize, like, oh my god, there's actually, when you add that more of, um, like, what you're into, like, uh, I love that as well, I love the whole character development, that stuff, and you, that's the thing, you have multiple layers of enjoying this medium. You have the whole childlike cosmic scope of the thing and then you have like the very intimate very micro very character driven character pain yes i think that's the interesting thing i think you can be attracted by one or the other and by possibly other hold on or by possibly other things or both but i feel eventually you will come to appreciate the more you read you will come to appreciate both aspects or even more aspects than that and I feel like if we want to attract young readers, we need to really work on not only having those deep moments, but also on getting the into, stuff. The, getting into the, what just that jaw drop. Like Richard Donner, 
had probably the greatest approach to Superman ever. You will believe a man can fly was the tagline for that movie. And you watch the movie as a child and the effects and the, the, the spectacle of it all is so perfect that you do. You do honestly believe Superman can fly. And that's what happened back in George's Re George Reeves' days too because he actually had to come out on stage dressed as Superman and say, remember, only Superman can fly because kids were so infatuated, so awestruck by the world, by the scope, by the intricacy that they were jumping off buildings and killing themselves because they thought if they put on a cape, they too could fly. But then when you watch the Donner movie as an adult and you, int and you look into the themes and you see the Jesus allegory and the, the idea of Superman saving the world, not in the spin around it sense, but in the the sense of saving us from ourselves, from the destruction that we are that we are bringing upon ourselves. It was, it's, it's staggering and it, it works best when they're together. And I feel that comics need to focus on bringing those two together more often and not trading one for the other. And God forbid, not just throwing in crap just to attract people to like, oh, look at this shocking thing. Let's see if we can get some media coverage. If we make Harley Quinn bust dead shot in the face or, or, or have sex with him and on the barn floor while dressed like fucking Daisy Duke. <sighs> you got anything else to say, Milan, or can we wrap it up? No, the whole Harley Quinn fucking dead shot on the floor of a barn dressed like Daisy Duke really covered the majority of what I was going to say, but, you know, yes, indeed. What a way to go out, Ian. All right, thanks for joining us, guys. We'll be back next week. I'm getting Bill and Milan back, and it's my week to choose to review something. So guess what, Milan? You got homework. You have to read Arkham Asylum, A Serious House on Serious Earth, Arkham Reborn, and one other Arkham story whose name escapes me at the moment, but I'll make sure... Oh, no! Arkham Asylum Madness. You have to read all three graphic novels, because we're going to do a compare and contrast of the themes of madness in all three of them. Ooh, that's really interesting, because I'm... I was mad myself, so maybe you have a serious... You have a genuine insane person's view on the thing. Well, we're all insane. So we'll be back next week with a compare and contrast on the three most prominent Arkham books in my collection and in, arguably, the whole body of work of Arkham stuff that's been out. And I'm making Bill read them, too, and he's going to be back here, and we're going to have the three back, damn it! <laughs> so we'll see you guys next week. Once again, please feel free to send in any music if you'd like. I'd love to have background music going for this. Give it a nice, cool NPR little feel to it. And uh, fan art, I'll also love to post. Just anything you guys got, send it in. I mean, we're here for an hour each week or more, so I can definitely put stuff up in the video. See you guys later.